try to make as seamless transition as possible between the rehearsal room and the recording studio. So, and I find as we strip away the, the glass wall between me and the band, that it's a more intimate and fluid communication. I'm Gareth Jones. I've been in the recording business, if you like, the recording game for over 30 years. I've had the great privilege of working with incredibly talented people over the years, including uh, you know, Depeche Mode and Nick Cave and more recently with uh, Grizzly Bear. And right now we're here at the very start of the recording sessions for Emmy the Great's new album in Red Bull Studios here in Tooley Street, London. I met Emmy through her, her management and I remember really loving her lyrics. There was that combination of a beautiful first record, great lyrics, lovely voice, made me want to make sure that Emmy's record was one of the records I did this year. I need to know that when I say the word beautiful to a producer, they and I mean the same thing. So, you know, I could say, I really want something beautiful and you could be thinking, oh, like Christina Aguilera's hair. And I could be thinking like a flower and, you know, it would be, we'd be in different directions, but I really feel with Gareth that we have similar definitions. Emmy and I had a bit of a chat, obviously, uh, at the very beginning of the process. We, we got together uh, and uh, went into a music room in her house to sketch some ideas out. And one of the things she said uh, about this record was that she felt that it should be a bit more poppy. On the one hand, she wanted them to be poppy, and on the other hand, she wanted them to be dark. So I was fishing for a bit, but one of the things I thought was if we could get some good beats on the songs, then we had a good chance of making them a bit more poppy. The way that sound came out of the loudspeaker uh, has always somehow been fascinating to me. On in my late teens, I discovered um, Pink Floyd, and I remember being very aware of the fact that this man called Alan Parsons was behind the mixing desk and recording particularly uh, the great classic Dark Side of the Moon. Let's just do one more from the top anyway because it wasn't as vibrant as it will be. I have a number of qualities I suppose that I bring to uh, record production. One of them that's very important is to create a space where artists feel safe and even if they don't feel comfortable, because comfortable isn't always the best way to, to create something or to deliver a performance. Sometimes some artists seem to need to feel quite stressed to deliver the right performance. He's very sort of maestro. He's very maestro about it. Actually, the other day in rehearsal, we all stopped because he went like that. And that's how much we are watching him to find out what to do next. And he went, and this is super maestro, he was like, oh no, I just do that when I'm happy. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So we, we cut it down to three, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, well, that, well you can do four. It doesn't matter, as you said. Sorry to yeah, there's a really good atmosphere in the studio. Gareth knows how to, to like diffuse situations. And we've always had tension in the studio. When we've been in charge of the production ourselves, we have no language that we share, and so we get really frustrated, but we've, this is the most relaxed we've ever had it. I work in the entertainment business, so I suppose that the pieces of work that I get asked about most are the ones that sell the most. Depeche Mode had already had hits by the time that I got on board. In fact, that's one of the things that put me off working with them, because they were like on the radio and stuff, and I didn't really like that kind of pop music. And we were working in Germany as well. So at the time, uh, in, in Hansa Studios, Hansa by the Wall, as it was then, there were, there were many uh, sessions, especially after we had uh, People Are People at six weeks for number one in Germany. We had like fans queuing outside the studio and stuff. I did very long sessions with Einstutzen and Neubauten, uh, very amphetamine fueled. I remember going home and, and getting some rest and then coming back in the morning, and the, because the band had been up all night, all around Berlin, they'd be there waiting at the studio door even when I got, even when I got there because they'd, they, they hadn't uh, taken any rest at all. Mm -hmm. 
when I started work in the studio, I buried myself in, in the studio. And so I didn't make the time to uh, discover enough new music or to go out to gigs or to concerts or to exhibitions uh, because I felt that it was just incredibly important to spend a, a, all of my life essentially in the recording studio but it's become clear to me that it's really important of course to get out go to gigs and to go to exhibitions I find it a great source of inspiration here we are at the legendary South Bank brutalist architecture now much loved by many of us here. Behind me, the Festival Hall. It's a, it's a great venue for me, obviously I'm a bit older. I like a nice sit-down venue where it's quiet and people are actually listening to the music. What we take from our life, our, our full cultural life outside the studio, we can bring into the studio, all of us, not just me, obviously everyone involved, to the benefit of the whole project. It sounds nice with the fingers. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know it's a little bit more uh, defined. Yeah. The starts of the notes are a little bit more defined with the Petra, but I don't know if that's worth nice losing the warm nice bottom end. Yeah. You know, I could just feel it in the room. There was less. It was like a bit thin in the room. It felt. I, mean, I was a bit disappointed. If we were going to overdub Iris, I was going to say, could we do it with the fingers? He's analytical as well, which is really important for me because I need to know why I want something. I can say I don't like that drum fill. But I'll never know why, because I don't think about music like that. I just think it makes me angry, sad. And he'll say, well, you don't like it because you said this was a, like a lament and this is more of a pop song drum fill. And I'll go, oh, okay, and he explains it. It's an educating experience. That the artist has to be happy because they have to go on and they have to transport the vision or, or they have to carry the vision to the public. If they don't believe in it, then hey, how can anyone else ever believe in it? I would love to carry on working until I drop because my, jo uh, my work or my job, if you like, is a passion that I'm lucky enough to be able to indulge. It's not something that I'm looking at stopping doing.